I'll never forget that Bojangles commercial. Elvis came up into the drive-thru. Give me one of the dual butter biscuits. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> anyway, we will uh, get more serious now. We're going to begin chapter 9 of Revelation. We might finish it, we might not. But you know what the good thing is? Regardless of what happens, I am prepared to go all the way to the end of chapter 10. So, I'm, I'm a little bit studied up right now. So, hopefully the, what I was just recently studying in the chapter 10 don't mix with chapter 9 and I get confused, confused myself. But, um, tonight we're going to get into chapter 9. It's going to be really interesting. Um... Boy, I, in, in, in studying this, uh, I won't say that I didn't know this, but it was something I forgot. And uh, in the next two chapters, we're, there's going to be some very interesting things that you might not have known about some of these chapters in the book of Revelation. But we will get there as we get there. To begin, we'll open with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll ask Pastor Kathleen. Father, we're here again, and I think the reason that we keep showing up, Lord, is because you have been successful in the past of teaching us new things, and we are very interested, and we are hoping to understand fully all the way to the end of Revelations, and we ask you to bless it, and we give you all the honor and glory and the praise. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Now, in, we're getting ready to start chapter 9, but what's getting ready to happen is also what happened back in chapter 7. In chapter 7, we saw that it was an interlude of the 6th and the 7th seal. Remember we talked about the 7 seals? In chapter 7, the servants of God in Jerusalem who were Christian Jews were sealed by God before the calamities began. They were sealed so that those calamities would not befall them. They would avoid it. We saw that this was actually an echo of what Ezekiel saw in vision in Ezekiel chapter 9 where Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians that time. Ezekiel saw, as it were, an angel going around with an inkhorn, putting marks on their heads of all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who sighed and cried over the abominations done in the city. Those who had a heart of God and who were the faithful remnant. They were delivered. They were spared from the calamity that befell those uh, who were not awake. The other angel seen in that vision in Ezekiel chapter 9 went out with battle axes in their hands and slaughtered everyone who didn't have the mark on their heads. Uh, it was a slaughter in 586 B.C. when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. But as I said, the remnant, they were spared. It's interesting that in biblical history, any time God brought judgment and destruction, what did he always do first? Yes, but... He spared the remnant who were faithful. It always happened. It happened even in Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? What did he do first? He wanted to get Lot out of there before he did anything. Right? Mm -hmm. He always spared a remnant of faithful ones. It happened um, in the destruction of Jerusalem with the Babylonians in 586. And it happened in 70 A.D. In fact, Jesus was an instrument in warning the people, when you see this and when you see that, flee to the mountains. Right? So, God always did that. He always saved his remnant. It was symbolized by the fact, in here in Ezekiel, that God had them marked on their foreheads. That was not a literal mark. I know how Lindsay likes to put movies on where you have people that have 666 or they have something, uh, you know, the text or in on their heads. It's not a literal mark. Remember, this is apocalyptic literature. Even Ezekiel was apocalyptic. 
But what that signified is if you had the mark on the forehead, it meant you made your you, you, you were right with God. That's what it meant. Right now, if you're right with God, you symbolically have a mark on your head. You might not see it when you look in the mirror, but your neighbors see it when they see how you act. That's your mark on the head. In Revelation chapter 7, God's servants in Jerusalem before the Holocaust of A.D. 70 are marked. The 144,000, and they did in fact escape. They escaped that Holocaust in 70 A.D. The 144,000, they did escape. And we also saw in the end of chapter 7, there was a great multitude of people of all nations, people's tongues who were saved. So God not only saved the remnant of Israel, but there was an overwhelming mass of the Gentiles as well that are seen in heaven, glorifying God who have come out of all of this. After that interlude in chapter 7, the long-awaited seventh seal is broken in chapter 8, verse 1. Now, nothing really happened when this happened. It's like everything's building up. Each seal gets a, a little worse than the previous one. And you get to the seventh and you're expecting the ultimate disaster and instead there's a silence in heaven for a half hour. Remember we talked about this? There's a silence. This may be understood to be the quiet before the storm. And then it appears these seven angels with seven trumpets this time, not seven seals, but now there's seven trumpets. There's a vision at the beginning of chapter 8 where there are prayers of the saints being offered up as incense before God. And this incense is entering into his nostrils. And these prayers are apparently bringing about the results that follows. Because the same incense burner that offers up the prayers throws bolts back to the earth. And then comes the seven trumpets. In chapter 8 we covered the first four of those trumpets. After the four trumpets were sound, an angel was flying in the midst of heaven. I might say that the Alexandrian text says it was not an angel. It, the Alexandrian text says it was an eagle that was flying in the midst of heaven. This being in, in chapter 8, verse 13, it says, And as I looked and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, or an, e an eagle, as some translations say, the Alexandrian text, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So what this is indicating is that the next three trumpets, the last three of the series, will be disastrous beyond the scope of the first four. So much so that the great pity is, is to be had for those experiencing what is about to take place with the sounding of these last three trumpets. We find that after the fifth trumpet is blown, it says in, in four was set off uh, for, for the last three. In chapter 9, verse 12, one woe is past. We're going to see the same thing in chapter 11, verse 14. After the sixth trumpet has been sounded, it, it says that the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So each of these three trumpets is a woe. And this is because they are set up by the first four by their intensity. Just as we saw there were seven seals. The first four were set off by the last three. So the first four each revealed a horseman of a different color in judgment. We remember studying that. So the first four seals were four horses, so, so called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The last three seals were different. But in this case, the first trumpets are passed over with rapidity, but the last three that are set from them is, is unusually intense, and we, and we get much more description of at least the fifth and the sixth trumpet. Now that I have said all that and introduced all this, now we're in chapter 9, and chapter 9 is occupying the fifth and the sixth trumpet. Let's begin to read. If someone would read chapter 9, someone could read 1 through 6, and then someone else jump in and read 7 through 12. 
Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, <laughs> and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion, which it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. And the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew in Ab is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Only uh, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So here we have the first woe. <coughs> this particular vision of the locust has captured the imagination of commentators probably more than any other passage in Revelation. The temptation is very great among those who see these events as fulfilled in the future and see it as a future modern war that is a domination, the, the landscape of this tribulation as the, as, as the approach of Armageddon and the modern wars leading up to it. Oh, how they have had many, many different ideas on what all this means. Uh, they see these locusts as some kind of military aircraft, I've heard. Helicopters are usually the suggestion of choice. The sound of their wings is like the sound of horses going into battle. You know how loud choppers are. They have crowns of something like gold. People say John is, is uh, taken off and he sees this in a vision. And, and he doesn't know anything about technology. He don't know what a helicopter is. To him, it just looks like locusts. That's what they say. Frankly, some helicopters do look like locusts. Some look like dragonflies. They do, not like, they do not look like insects to someone from a distance. Uh, the crowns of gold could be the reflection of the sun off the plexiglass bubble, as they say. They had faces like men, hair like women. Difficult to know exactly what that is. Efforts are made to, to, to make this look like some military machine. Some even say that they're UFOs. The helicopters is usually what is accepted, even among commentators, to say that they're taking Revelation very literally. It's very common among dispensationalists to say that they're talking about everything literal, yet they're not. What it says is that they are locusts with scorpion tails, but obviously, if it, something looks like a locust and it has a scorpion tail, it obviously has to be symbolic. I don't think they are symbolic of aircraft. Those who say they, that they're aircraft are not really taking it symbolically. They're saying John is seeing something. He's given a literal description of what he sees, but he's mistaken of what it is. That's why that he says it's a locust. That we would recognize them as helicopters coming in battle array when he, at that time, John, would be unfamiliar with them. So what John thinks is that what he's seen is a locust plague. Now, there are things about this that makes it difficult to identify. It could be helicopters. One thing is they don't kill people, though. 
Military helicopters do kill people. We're, we're told in Revelation that they're not killing people. So to say that this is a military instrument coming, that doesn't fit the description of military because when the military comes, what are they expecting to do? Kill. Uh, they have missiles and they don't torment people for five months and leave them alive as it says in our passage. When you use a missile, are you tormenting somebody for five months? You might torment them for three seconds and then they're, they're, they're done. No pun intended. Well done. In most cases, they kill as does any other military weapon. It's emphatic that they don't kill people. It stresses that in our reading that this does not kill people. It's repeated twice. They only torment them for five months. Hard to know how to fit that into a scenario of them being helicopters. Likewise, they don't destroy any green thing. The helicopters, when they shoot must missiles, are they looking for green things? Does a helicopter distinguish or discriminate on what color it's going to hit? No. Also, they don't hurt those who have the seal of God on their foreheads. These are the 144,000 who were sealed on their forehead in chapter 7. They were sealed to be preserved from this kind of thing. They're kept safe. I suppose we could imagine a time in the future when the saints are in the midst of warfare, missiles are flying, machine guns firing everywhere, but God preserves the Christians. Now that's not an unimaginable thing to think of. But generally speaking, though, military machines kill indiscriminately whole towns, whole populations, whole neighborhoods, whatever they attack. They don't discriminate between the Christians and non-Christians. But whatever this is in Revelation chapter 9, it sounds like these do discriminate who they're going to kill. These are under direct orders to afflict those who are not Christians, but to leave the Christians alone. So what are they? What is it that we're talking about here? If a dispensationalist wanted to be quite literal, they would say that they are in fact mutant insects. They are locusts with scorpion tails. Now, we have to remember where they're coming from. They, 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 they appear out of the smoke that arises that we call the bottomless pit in our translation. In the Greek, it's called the abyss. The term is sometimes translated abyss and sometimes the bottomless pit. But it is the place where demonic powers are incarcerated it is a place that later we read in Revelation chapter 20 that Satan the dragon is bound with a chain and thrown into. Later he's released from the abyss and this is a place that stands for the enslavement of captivity of demons. In fact, in Luke chapter 8, when Jesus encountered the man at the tomb who was inhabited by a legion of demons, you remember what they begged him in Luke chapter 8 verse 31? Please don't send them to the don't send us to the abyss. Remember that? He accommodated them momentarily. Where they went after the pigs died, we don't know. The point is the demon saw the abyss as a terrifying prospect for them, a place where he could send them and they would be trapped there. We read in both Second Peter and Jude that the angels who are sent are held in chains and darkness waiting the judgment of the great day. The word abyss is not used in those passages. The word abyss is not used, but the word Tartarus is. We have no other place in the entire scripture for this reference. So it's not, poss it's, it, it's not impossible that Tartarus is the name for the abyss, but we can't verify it with another scripture. We'll not press that point. The point there is a place that Peter called Tartarus, which he said that fallen angels are in captivity. But we know that the demons were afraid to be sent to the abyss, the bottomless pit, and they knew Jesus could send them there if he wished. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, you might remember parts of this story, and we're going to study this later, but I'll go on and read this. Revelation 11, verse 7 it says, when the two witnesses had finished their witness, the beats, 
The beast that ascends out of the abyss will make war against them and will overcome them and kill them. The very same beast that is seen rising out of the sea in chapter 13. It's clear that the beast is simply the devil with skin on him because in chapter 12, the devil is described as a dragon, as having seven heads and ten horns and, and red, and likewise the beast is described just exactly the same in, in a thin disguise. Now, it's not easily hidden that this is the, de the, the devil embodied in some form. We'll worry about what form that is later. But the beast is said to come out of the bottomless pit. There was some angel or Jesus that incarcerated the devil himself in this bottomless pit for a while in Revelation chapter 20. Now, these creatures come out of the abyss. All we know about the abyss is it's the place that the demons are kept. Now, it would appear to be a release of demons upon whoever the victims are of these visions. I have suggested that when we read the word earth, the better translation in this context would be what? Land. I need to clarify for those who haven't heard this discussed before. Land is not really a better translation. It's just an equally good one. That the word in Greek can be translated land or earth with equal justice. It is in the word in Greek for land or, or for earth. The question here is, are we talking about things that are happening to the earth, the world? Or are we talking about something that's happening to the land, a specific area? That is the land. What land would it be if it's a specific area? The land of Israel. My suggestion has been is that if we translate the, all this word earth into land, which is something that many commentators in the past have suggested we should do, then we're looking at a calamity that's coming on the land of Israel. That would be suited to the general theme of the book, as I understand it. We're talking about the invasion of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Now, these locusts are not the Romans, in my opinion. I believe the Romans appear when the sixth trumpet is sounded. These locusts are something that come and does harm before the Romans do. In the sixth trumpet, people are going to be killed. This trumpet blast isn't killing anyone. It's just tormenting them. This is not the end. This is just the time that makes people wish it was the end. Because it said there these people desire to die, but they can't. They're looking forward to the end, but it isn't coming. There's five more months of torment. My suggestion is to be, and I will give you much support for this and, and is it, that it's the referring to the unleashing of hordes of demons upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem during the siege. Did you catch what I just said? The five months of torment in this fifth trumpet blast was demonic hordes coming against them, the people of Israel, as it led up to Rome coming in to destroy them. Now, I have support for this. Before I ever had any reason to interpret this passage that way, what did I tell you I did? I read Josephus, right? In fact, Lane has a copy of it right now, and he's going to start probably start reading this because what I'm going to say tonight is going to get him really interested in that book. I had read enough to get a sense of what was going on in the siege of Jerusalem. I remember thinking there is no way that intelligent people, most Jews are intelligent, that they would be so absolutely wicked toward each other and toward themselves in the months that led up to Rome coming to besiege them. They acted against their individual self-interest while they were besieged by the Romans outside. Who was the real enemy? It wasn't their brother. It was Rome on the outside who was the real enemy. But in the inside, these Jews took the leisure to kill each other and to divide into three warring factions in the city and to wage war inside the city with each other. To destroy each other's food supplies when everybody was starving. Does that make any sense? That would be like we have a gas shortage and our government would decide to just start to burning it. Would that make any sense? If we had a gas shortage, you're going to burn all the gas? 
Well, that's what happened here. They had a food shortage. And they were destroying their food. If anyone had brain one, they would have thought, wait a minute, if we stop killing each other, we might survive. But they were crazy. These Jews were mad. Mad crazy. The details that Josephus records of the things that they did were so astonishing, you would never read anything like it. You would never imagine how intelligent people could have reacted and acted that way. When Jesus said there will be great tribulation which has never occurred since the world began nor ever shall be, when you read Josephus, you can very well believe it. It is hard to imagine anything that bad ever before or afterward. Josephus never knew what Jesus or Revelation said. He was just there. He researched. He interviewed the people there. He got the information and he wrote it down. In fact, Josephus himself said, quote, this is my, this, he basically said this was his opinion and that there, he had never seen anything in all of history as astonishing as the behavior of these people during the siege because they did not act like intelligent beings at all. You know how they acted? Like wild animals or demons. When I was reading Josephus, it occurred to me, it is obvious that demon possession was rampant in the city of Jerusalem prior to Rome's besieging it. It was later when I was reading it that it occurred to me, duh, we see it right there in chapter 8. One of the demons come out in horrid swarm of locusts and torment the people. Now it says here for five months. Generally speaking, the time designations in Revelation are not usually literal. This might not be either, though it is difficult to know what five months would symbolize. There is a sense that it could be literal, and that the siege of Jerusalem, the final one, and the time when the craziness inside the city was at its worst, guess when it began? In April of A.D. 70. Guess when it ended? September of A.D. 70. Do the math. How many months is that? From April to September. Five months. Because if you're going to count April. Well, when you're counting from April to September, you always start with the next month when you're counting, right? May, June, July. May, June, July, August. September. September. It was a five-month period of siege, and it was the worst period of time that Josephus described. This could be a literal length of time that these locusts supposedly were unleashed and tormented the people with insanity. This was before the Romans came in and physically did them in. They were spiritually possessed, spiritually wiped out before the Romans even got in. Josephus continues to bring out that the Romans were often more compassionate toward these Jews when they saw how miserable their own behavior had made them. This is surprising because the Romans were not generally compassionate people, but they were so shocked by what they saw in the behavior and the self-inflicted misery that these Jews were in that when they came into the city, Josephus often comments on how the Romans felt pity and were reluctant to do harm to them because when they looked at these people and the condition that they were in, they actually felt sorry for them. But the Romans quickly got over it. If you turn to Matthew chapter 12, I believe Jesus explains what we're reading here in these five months of torment. There are five or six times in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus makes comments of what he called this generation. While um, some people want to use the word as a, a race or a family, when you read all the cases where Jesus uses the term this generation, it doesn't work as a race. The word generation means all people living at the same time. For Jesus said in, in chapter 11, the people of this generation are like children playing in the streets, saying we piped for you and you didn't dance and we played a dirge for you and you wouldn't mourn. He said that it was the character of this generation, and he explained it. 
Because John the Baptist came to you and you say he has a demon. He played a dirge and you wouldn't mourn with him. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking and you wouldn't dance with him. You said he was a wine drinker, glutton, friend of sinners. Now Jesus said he was describing who? That generation. What generation? The generation that had occasion to react to John the Baptist and Jesus. His own generation. Likewise, later, when we're all familiar with the statement he made in Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, someone like to read that real quick? Matthew 24, verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these, all these, Things be fulfilled. So what is described in Matthew 24 is also spoken of in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, This generation will not pass. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, Some of you standing here will not die before this happens. Obviously, he leaves no doubt when he says, This generation will not pass. He means that some people living at the, that time will not die until this happens. There will be people living of his contemporaries when all the things previous to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 verse 34 would take place. Does this sound like we're actually talking about something futuristic for us? No. No. He's talking to his contemporaries and he's saying, this generation, not all of you are going to die before these things start to happen. Well, when he said it, and when Jerusalem fell, how many years was that? Forty years. You think a 20 or 30 year old might still be living in 40 years? Yeah. Very, very, most likely. In Matthew chapter 12, let's, let's read this one. Um, I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 12, and now I'm going to get to that point. <laughs> In chapter 12, if someone could read verses 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes... He finds it empty, mm -hmm. swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Now, those of us who have done deliverance ministry, we, we quote this scripture a lot, we, right? We know this scripture. Yeah. But have you ever thought about how this statement ends? Isn't that an unexpected end to that paragraph? After he says, um, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first, what's the last statement he makes after he says that? So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Where'd that come from? Isn't that an unexpected, weird way to end what he was saying? Sounds like he's giving us some information of what happens with demon-possessed people. Once the demon comes out, they tend to want to come back and bring friends with them, right? Mm -hmm. He's talking about when a demon comes out of a man. The state of the man in the last state is worse than before. He's talking about an individual and a problem with demon possession. But then he says, so shall it also be with this generation. What? This generation will be like a man who has a demonic problem that Jesus cured but did not do more than sweep and garnish the house and left the house empty and the demons came back in force. Seven times more. Seven means a total number. Completeness, right? The man was somewhat demon-possessed when he had a demon. When the last state came, he was totally demon-possessed. He was totally given over to bondage and demons. What happened? When Jesus was on earth, didn't he spend a lot of time casting out demons? 
They didn't bother. And they and they left, right? Yeah. He 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 freed a lot of people of demon possession. But they But in the last of Israel in 70 AD before Rome besieged them and destroyed them they it wasn't just a few, a man over here has demon possession that Jesus cured a man over here had demon possession that Jesus cured. A man over there had demon possession that Jesus cured. The whole Israel was demon possessed. Seven times, Seven times worse. Wow. That is really what he was talking about. We use this all the time to talk about demons when we're delivering people, right? Yeah. But Jesus was telling us this not to give us a lesson in deliverance. He was telling us this to say that's how Israel was. While I'm here now, I'm cleaning out some demon possession. But in the last, it's going to be worse. The whole, the whole Israel will be demon possessed. That corresponds to the five months of torment and the locust in, the, in, that, in that trumpet. In that fifth trumpet. That's interesting, isn't it? May, may have never went there. May, may have never thought to go there, but that's what I'm. That's that's what I see. That's when you look at what Jesus is saying, and you look at what John's saying, and 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 you're putting all this together. It makes sense. This does, in fact, parallel this generation that Jesus came to. It's interesting how little we read in the Old Testament about demons. In fact, the term demon in the, in the way we read it in the New Testament does not seem to appear anywhere in the Old Testament. We do read in the Old Testament of evil spirits. But you could say, I guess that's the same thing. In the New Testament, the term evil spirits is, is also used though. But in the Old Testament, we just read of a person having an evil spirit. But that's usually God sends an evil spirit against Saul or the men of Shechem or a lying spirit to the prophets of Ahab. Or we read of someone having a familiar spirit, which is usually a medium. They're apparently demon-possessed either way. Those references in the Old Testament are found very rarely. But once Jesus comes on the scene, demons are everywhere. Have you ever thought about that? There's some references to an evil spirit here or an evil spirit there. Jesus pops up. He spends a great majority of his ministry delivering people from them. Well, he spent he spent forty he spent forty days and forty nights to start before his ministry with the devil. Amen. Can I ask a question? So when you said all of Israel at the end was all of Israel was demon possessed. So but you're saying demons, not that all the people were totally Remember the remnant left the city. They were gone. Marcy. Uh -huh. The city they were in there eating each other. They were in there killing each other, destroying each other's food, hurting each other. There was three different war f uh, factions going on in the city of Jerusalem when Rome was still outside. Rome hadn't even got in there yet. And they were already in there destroying themselves before Rome even came in. That's what I said. When Rome came in, Rome was felt sorry for them. When he saw that some of them looked half-starved and looked all beat up and and they were uh, uh, fighting each other and killing each other. I'm sure some of those soldiers thought, why are we here? Why don't we just let them destroy themselves? They were under demon possession. That's what those locusts mm -hmm. coming out of the pit was. Yeah. Well, when did the work there... Weren't there Rome? Weren't Rome uh, govern the Pilate and all them in Jerusalem during this time too? I mean, the, the way that worked was, 
I, I, uh, man, my mind just went blank. You had the governor that had a quarter that was in Judea. It was not directly in the city of Jerusalem, but it was in Judea where Pilate was. You know, they, they had their, 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 the Roman officials were in those areas. Right. So when they besieged Jerusalem, there was no harm to the government quarters that were in other parts. It would be like um, you got Sanford and you got Jonesboro and you got Broadway. And the government quarters was in Broadway, but they're going to block off San Sanford and destroy it. You see, yes, they were near, but it, it, they weren't in the line of fire. And it may be that during that time, because of what was happening, the, they could have easily packed up, the, the, the governor could have easily packed up and went to Rome while that was happening too. I don't know. If they knew that they were going to destroy the whole city and it was going to be a big mess, they may have gotten gotten completely out of the area. What well, did did uh, Caesar order? I mean, who who ordered the destruction? It came from the government. Well, it, it was it was God. Caesar. God put it in the heart of the Roman government to do it. Yeah. That's why God destroyed Jerusalem, but he used somebody else. Yeah, to do. I mean, Just like when Babylon was used to destroy Israel, but it was God's punishment. You see, God didn't literally send angels with, with, yeah, with, the backs, like, with axes, battle like axes. He's using Biden now to destroy us exactly. today. <laughs> Very well. That might be a good analogy. He allowed Biden to get there, whether he got there legitimately or not. He allowed it to happen to bring some kind of either to awaken us because he's getting ready to do something or to punish us because he's disappointed with us. Very possible. Now, what was holding the people in Jerusalem? They came in and built a fort around the whole city. Rome did. That's why they, they didn't oh, okay. have any trees. They okay. cut down all the trees. Okay, that explains it. They were starving. They couldn't go out and get to their fields and get their food. Whatever food was in the city is all they had. And it was running out. So that's that's what happened. I mean it's it's kinda of hard to imagine that, but that's exactly what happened. Now Well that was kind of crazy for Rome to think that they felt sorry for them when they had actually created the situation that caused these people to start killing each other and fighting each other and destroying each other's food sources, etc., etc., etc. True. It was kind of crazy for them to feel sorry for them. But again, what was it that was really in the people? The demons. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It was the demons. That's why Jesus said, Jesus was crying. When they were bring, taking him to the cross and the women were crying, he looked at the women and he said, I, don't cry for me. You need to cry for yourself and your children. Because in your lifetime, you're going to see something a whole lot worse than me being uh, beaten and taken to the cross. Remember that? <laughs> he said, don't, don't weep for me. You need to weep for yourself and your children. Especially your children. As far as the big dog, kings and whatever up for men, all that death and that smell and that fire... Oh, they, they had the hill anyway at the top of the mountain or somewhere else before we went down to them. Yeah, we talked about the, 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 the ocean and the, the smell and the stench. and the, They probably got out of there because they didn't want to be a part of it. Very, very good point. Now, one of the pecu peculiarities of the gospel that we have learned is once Jesus is there, demons are all over the place. Demons were just here or there, a wicked spirit here or there in the Old Testament. But Jesus spent a great majority of his ministry casting them out. Every time Jesus goes somewhere, he runs into demon-possessed people. In the synagogue, in the temple, in the tombs, out in the streets. Many times it says Jesus went out in all the villages in Galilee, healing the sick. And what was the very next thing it said? And casting out all the demons. It was almost like demon possession was a matter-of-fact disgust as sickness. 
You know, it, it was that common. Go to town, he'll sit and cast out demons. It was a major part of Jesus' ministry. Everywhere he went, he was casting out demons. You don't even find the phenomenon of demon possession before Jesus arrived. So what happened there? Well, it says in Revelation chapter 12 that when Jesus was about to be born, the dragon was poised to kill the child at his birth, but he failed. Remember? It does look like the devil was waiting for people. The devil knew he was coming and was threatened by him. It seems to have launched a preemptive attack like when he tried to get Herod to kill him by killing all the babies of Bethlehem under the age of two. Remember? It may be that Satan also leashed demons on the population to resist the movement of Jesus while he was here. We can't be sure, but we do read in Revelation that the devil was definitely mindful of the arrival of Jesus and willing to do everything he could to stop him. That may be the reason the demons were seen in force when Jesus shows up, but not before. But what did Jesus do? He cast those demons out. Everywhere he went, he cast demons out of the people. By the time Jesus left, I don't think there were many villages left where Jesus cast the demons out of. He even sent his disciples out two by two on several occasions. And on each occasion, he said, cast out demons, heal the sick. Not only was Jesus going out and casting out demons, but his disciples were trained to do the same. This was quite an assault on the demonic powers. When the 70 came back and reported in Luke chapter 10, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And what did Jesus say when, when they said that? He said, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I think he was saying that's the end for Satan. Me coming and what you're doing is the beginning of the end of Satan. This is Satan's downfall here. We're making a major attack on all of his villages and throwing out all of his troops. This is the downfall of the enemy. And it was because Jesus defeated him at the cross that we know for sure the devil was brought down. But he was in the process of defeating him in his ministry. And by the time Jesus was done and left, Israel was like a man who had a demon cast out of him. He was free. Israel was free by the time Jesus went to the cross. They were free of all them demons. Praise God. Hallelujah. But what does Isaiah 59 verse 19 say? When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Satan's forces came in like a flood in Israel. Jesus raised up a standard of opposition to them and he overcame them. By the time Jesus' ministry was over, there weren't many demons left in Israel. Now you find some in Ephesus and various places in the book of Acts, but not in Israel. The point is Jesus had come and cleaned, cleaned the house like a man who had a demon cast out of him. Israel had been given a second chance to get it right. Now the demon's gone. You need to fill that space. You need to embrace Christ. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to fill that vacuum. But did Israel take it? No. Jesus came in and cleaned their house. If they would have accepted Jesus and allowed the Holy Spirit to fill them, their house would have stayed clean. God poured out His Holy Spirit on the inhabitants of Jerusalem at Pentecost. Thousands of them received Him, but not all. Those who did not still had that vacuum. Jesus said, this generation is going to be in danger like a man who had the demons cast out of them, but doesn't, but doesn't close that door. He doesn't fill that void. That original demon and seven more worse are going to come back and that man's state is going to be totally in bondage to demons. Jesus said that is what this generation is going to be like. Did it happen? Yeah. Most certainly it did. At the beginning of that generation, Jesus cast out their demons, and at the end, the demons came back in multitudes, in swarms like locusts that tormented them for five months. You cannot read Josephus with any kind of knowledge of the New Testament or spiritual realities without concluding 
that these people were just totally blinded, totally deceived, totally tormented by dem demonic powers. If somebody cannot see the truth of Christ and cannot receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul himself said the devil has blinded their minds. So, <clears throat> so would you say they didn't feel the void, they left the door open, okay, these people that were possessed by demons, so it actually wasn't the people, it was, they were so blinded by the demons and by Satan, they couldn't help it. That's just, they were so blinded, they couldn't understand, they couldn't see that I'm actually destroying the food that my neighbor needs because he's starving to death. So maybe God sent Rome to like put them out of their, he felt pity then? and Well, he, God's, God dead? sending Rome was not pity. It was his judgment on them. But the Rome, in turn, when they saw the pitiful condition of these crazed people in Jerusalem, Rome did feel pity for them. But that pity didn't last long because Rome still did what they were called to do. They still wiped them out. I believe that this is what Revelation is saying. The fifth trumpet sounds... And this innumerable horde come out of the pit, this place where demons are incarcerated, they are let go. You have a demon incarcerated, and he hadn't been able to, to do anything for I no telling how long. That might have been some of the, 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 the demons that, you know, they said uh, had relations with the men. Okay. And they were put into Tartarus. Well, that... I, if that's true, if that if, if that interpretation of Genesis 6 is true, I'm just connecting some dots here. They've been incarcerated for a very long time, and now you're going to unleash them? There was probably all types of, of sexual crimes being committed in Jerusalem, too, that we don't know about. With children, with women, with homosexuality. There could have been all kinds of other things that were... That, 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 you know, we, we, we haven't really gotten into or, or hadn't. They, 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 that was one of the hush-hush things. We're not going to talk about that. We don't know what type of, of, of demonic possession that there was, but you, you can't read Josephus and not say with what these people were doing and the way they were acting toward each other and the evilness in them. People torturing their own families for no reason. What makes you do that? Kill them eating their own babies. Yeah. Right. They were starving and women were giving birth and eating their babies. What makes you do that? The devil. The devil. <coughs> Demon possession. Jude 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, mm -hmm. he hath reserved in everlasting change under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Yeah. But there again, tar if, if this abyss is Tartarus, that's exactly what Jude was talking about. Yeah. It could be that they, they were put there and they were put immediately back, but they, they were unleashed from the bottomless yeah. pit. You just don't know what kind of evil happened. Uh, th th I'm making some liberties here with some assumptions, but I'm not saying that that's totally what it was, but... You can put some things together and imagine how bad it could have been. We are talking here about demon possession. And I do believe that this innumerable horde uh, that comes out of the pit that had uh, locust, faces of locust and tails of scorpions, I, I do believe these were incarcerated demons and they were unleashed upon the people of the land and they tormented them for five months. Now, I will say this, we know we're not talking about real locusts here. Okay? It's almost as if the vision deliberately gives special details so that we know we're not talking about regular locusts. Two things about these locusts are different than regular locusts. One is in verse 4. They're commanded not to harm the grass or, eat, or, or any green tree uh, uh, or anything like that. I remember my grandfather told a story Back probably in the 40s or 50s, he went to Arizona for some type of ministry assignment. And they actually had a, um, a locust attack in Arizona. 
And my grandfather had one of them old 1940, 1950 mint green cars. You know, mint green was a popular color back then. Those locusts ate the paint right off his car. Anything green, a locust is going to attack it and eat it. Anything green, they're going to attack it and eat it. They're commanded, these locusts are commanded not to touch anything green. That doesn't sound like a real locust, does it? They don't hurt people, but it said, but they sure do hurt vegetation. Uh, these in Revelation are different. They hurt people. Furthermore, it says specifically in verse 11, they have a king over them. Not only does locusts not have a king over them, but the scripture goes out of the way to point out that the locusts do not have a king over them. Did you know the Bible says that? Proverbs 30, verse 27. Proverbs 30, verse 27. The locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. <laughs> These locusts do have a king over them. Okay? <laughs> the scripture goes out of the way to say the locusts have no king, yet Revelation specifically says that these do. These are ruled over. Who, who are they ruled over by? The demon who opened the pit. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 says, Then the fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Mm. Who do you think that star is? Could be Satan. If it is, he's said to be the one who is king over them. The name is Abad, Abad, Abaddon. A-B-A-D-O-N. In Hebrew, this means destruction. But the Greek word is Apollyon, which means destroyer. It's interesting that the Hebrew and Greek names are given here, not just the Greek. The book is written in Greek. Why, why, did, did, why give the Hebrew name? Well, it may be a tip to the readers. There, it may be that the readers are, be, be, are given a tip here. Remember, who would be reading this letter initially? Hebrew-speaking people. In my opinion, um, the number 666 was a reference to Caesar Nero's name in a Hebrew form. Isn't destruction and destroying basically the same thing? It is. It out. But, again, remember numerology, 666, if you translate that into Greek, you're not going to get Caesar Nero. But if you translate the numerology into Hebrew, you do get Caesar Nero. John said earlier when he talked about the man, that 666, he said, you who are clever and wise, calculate this and figure it out. I'll give you the hint. The man's name is 666. I, if, if, if I, I suspect is this is a reference to that the Hebrew rendering of Caesar Nero, which does total 666, and the Latin and the Greek do not. It's code so that the Romans, while they're reading this, wouldn't be able to understand it. Because the Romans did not understand Hebrew, right? right? When they tried to calculate it into Greek and Latin and the languages that they understood and knew, oh, this, this is rubbish. This doesn't make any sense. But for a Jew who understood Hebrew, who is now a Christian reading it, oh. That's Apollyon. Ah, oh, ooh, ah, Caesar Nero. They knew it. Many of what John wrote, many of the things he wrote was for code so that the Christians would read it. If a Roman soldier were to pick it up, they wouldn't be able to understand it. Now, there are some Hebrew words scattered throughout Revelation. Armageddon is one. Alleluia. Abaddon, the Hebrew name, it may be one of the hints to the wise to take into consideration when they're calculating the name of the beast. Now, this, of course, could be a stretch. You certainly are not obligated to hold that view. But to me, there's no better answers as to why this name was listed in Greek and Hebrew. Why throw in a Hebrew word? Does it make any sense? There, there could have been a very good... Good reference there. Good, good sense made there. Let me see how much. I really would like to go more, 
and to finish this, but I'm, there's no way I can do it in the allotted time. Um, next week, we're going to start back by talking about this star in verse 1 that has fallen in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. We're going to go into Revelation chapter 12. We're going to see some things that Jesus said in Luke chapter 6. And then we're going to get back into our chapter, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 6. And we're going to begin to dissect these verses again. And we should then be able to get into the sixth trumpet. We'll see how all this goes. I, I, oh, how I would have loved to have finished this, but... I wouldn't do it justice if I just skimmed it and rushed through it. Are there any questions? Is some of this making sense to you? Mm -hmm. So, from what we discussed, to see if you if you understand it, this fifth trumpet, based on the the rollout of the information that I've shared with you tonight, what is the the fifth trumpet. Demon possession. Explain the sanity of, this, of the time and the way things went down. That's right. All, and this all happened before April of 70 AD, before Rome came in and besieged the city. It said that the people would want to die, but they couldn't. And when they got possessed with those demons and that city went crazy. I pictured all those demons coming out when he prayed them out of people, mm -hmm. rising up and waiting for that opportunity to come back into the people. And they would come back in, in, in judgment. It was a judgment of God on them. Come back in multitudes. Sad thing is, some of the people, the very people who were delivered, may have already been dead. These would be a whole new people getting those demons. Now, the whole generation wouldn't be alive. But as long as contemporaries of that generation were still alive, then what Jesus said, this generation will by no means pass away. Those, some, as long as some of those contemporaries were still living, they saw it. So, it, it, it is... Kind of blows your mind. But Lane, when you find that in that book, you'll you'll appreciate that now. Yeah. The uh what happened but right before Rome came in and what happened with the people and the way they were acting. You cannot read that book and, and come out with any other conclusion that these people had to be demon possessed. And it it fell right in line with what, what Jesus talked about. He come back seven times worse. And then right at the end of it, he said, basically, this is what's going to happen to this generation. I had never I, I had never used that scripture to make that comparison. You know, to, I always use that scripture, but he's basically saying, Israel, this is, this is going to happen to you. And when you read Revelation chapter 9, you see it. You see, you see what John said was getting ready to happen. And then when you read Josephus, you actually read that it did. Jesus said it, John said it, and then Josephus confirmed it. So, okay, well we'll stop there. We will be back here next Wednesday. We'll be back in town. And uh, we will proceed. Any questions? I'm just... just thinking about something that part of my mind about this. Uh, not just that land, that time, but even now, if you just got in your wife and you turn your back on them, I want to see demons come up in me. It would be worse than what it was yeah. the first time. The hell I have been through for 40 or 50 years. If you, if you had so that, the freedom... That's giving you a strong spirit, uh, fear of God, but just exactly. in itself. And those of us who have done deliverance ministry, that's what we tell people. You're delivered. Why not? 
don't stay that way. You need to make sure you keep your house clean. You make sure you don't open any doors for any activity. If you've been freed from demon possession, you don't watch horror movies. You don't get intrigued with the things on television. You don't get intrigued with the paranormal stuff. You don't get intrigued by those things because what are you doing? You're opening up a door. If you've been, if you've had problems with demons, you don't get involved in, in pornography and things like that. Because you're opening up a big door for those demons to come back. And when they come back, it's going to be worse to get, it's going to be harder to be delivered the second time than it was the first time. It passed from generation to generation, right? Which brings it seems that there have been some families that have been plagued with this problem because you know why? Because the families are doing the same habits. That's why it's not uh, you're automatically going to have a demon because your daddy had a demon. But if you gr grew up and you were taught to do what daddy always did or mama always did and you do it too, the demons are in their territory. So the sins of the father are traveled by right. it's demonic not, power. Exactly. Exactly. Because you're doing the same thing your daddy did. If your daddy ran, uh, uh, cheated on your mama and beat your mama and drank and was an alcoholic and, and, and that's what you are, you know, it's, it's because you're doing this. Now, you, you, anybody can break that cycle. I'm not going to live like my daddy lived, and I'm not going to watch what my daddy watched. I'm not going to drink what my daddy drank. I'm not going to do that. And you, you don't have to be under the confounds of that. But when it talks about generational curses, it's not that you're automatically di disposed to it. What it means is you still have a choice. Are you going to rise above it and say, this isn't right and I'm not going to live that way? Or are you going to follow in the same habits? Yeah. Unfortunately, children are followers. Many children follow into their, and they're, and they're told that what they're doing, there's nothing wrong with it. That's, what, that's the biggest reason, part of the biggest reason I believe I was dealing with was that for quite some time, for centuries. But when I couldn't do it, but with God's help, I ain't never hit a child. I've had a bunch of kids. Mm -hmm. Never spanked them as a baby. But my daddy beat me. I mean, he closed my eyes shut. Yeah. Type of beatings. Somehow or another, God helped me not even. He's merciful. Touch on my butt. He showed you mercy. Ain't, there, ain't nobody going to do it around me either. Mm -hmm. I've gotten, I went to jail over there a couple times, like in a Walmart. Small child, so man, backhand a child in the face. I'm all over him, like wild on rice. Yeah, just comes automatic out of me. I'm just being kids, mm -hmm. babies. Yeah, we're always been that way. But we have a choice on whether or not we're going to continue the generational it. curse or not. I, I would say she didn't, didn't, could not realize that I had a choice before, before I was trying to make. Yeah, until. Last three or four years, God's took them my life and took the alcohol away. And I have realized I did have a choice. I do have That's a right. choice. And to think things through and, and, and talk to God about it. Yeah, I'm going to make it Okay. Well, we'll close with a word of prayer. Brother Lane, would you do that? Dear Lord, we just thank you for being our Savior, Lord, that you deliver us from the the wiles of the devil, Lord, Thanks because Lord, you. your word tells us he is a deceiver, and he just he blinds. He don't mm -hmm. come as a lot of evil. He comes and and portrays to be a, a light sometimes, Lord. Yes, Lord, and this help us to have discernment, help us that the Holy Ghost will strengthen us and give us discernment and give us wisdom how to how to overcome him, Lord. And we just thank you for this. We thank you for loving us. We ask that you would continue to be with our country, our yes, leaders, 
our president, Lord. Lord, touch his life. Help him to see that he needs to put his trust in you, Lord, and to, and to just to ask for forgiveness of, of his sins, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Continue to, to bless our family. Ask for your guidance and protection. And we, we give you all the praise and honor and glory for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Take them Amen. demons out of our president.